terrific, Christy. Thank you so much. Trust him. He'll take care of you. It's my honor and privilege to introduce you to Greg Kokel. Uh, we have a young man named Matt Burford in our church, and Matt and Holly uh, introduced me to Greg initially, and actually they have funded and provided this weekend with Greg Kokel out of their great generosity. So I dialed into Greg Kokel and started listening to him on Stand to Reason. He has a radio show actually in Los Angeles, and I was overwhelmed. Uh, Greg has been given an unusually bright intellect, tremendous articulate communication capacities. Uh, he is a phenomenal Christian with a great sense of the big picture and can articulate why the Christian, the Christian has the best worldview going in the market of ideas. So we have Greg here, and it's, it's a wonderful privilege to allow this man of God to come and to speak to our hearts. He did a phenomenal job yesterday of talking about what it means to share Christ in this pluralistic society. And today he's going to come and talk about credo, what we believe. Uh, he has a unique background, as we all do, from Chicago, went to UCLA 37 years ago, encountered Christ, and his life took the right turn. Uh, but he has been interviewed from CNN to BBC and a lot in between. He is a marvelous brother in Christ, and you will enjoy coming to know Greg Kokel. Would you help me welcome him to First Baptist today? Thank you, Dave. Thanks, buddy. Wow, I have really been enjoying the Southern hospitality here the last couple of days since I've been here. It's actually a little bit of a problem because uh, I, I try to keep my girlish figure here, you know. And I, every time I turn around, people are handing me plates of food. So uh, it's, it's just a wonderful expression of hospitality, though, and I appreciate uh, being a part of your community. I have often wondered, though, uh, when talking with Christians and, and interacting with them, with people who consider themselves Christian, they, they seem in some sense uh, to be confused about things that I think they should be more clear on. Let me give you some examples. Uh, a lot of times when I listen to Christians talking, it seems to me that they're confused about how the world works. Uh, take the problem for evil, uh, for example. I know in the Q&A session coming up at 5 o'clock, that's one of the issues that's going to come up when I deal with, even in churches, this comes up all the time, and it mystifies me a little bit. People say, well, why would God allow all of this evil in the world? Why would He allow things like Katrina uh, to happen? Or, or disasters like in Haiti. Uh, why would God allow disasters to happen in my own life? Uh, why would he hap these happen to me? God should protect me from these kinds of things. And when I hear these statements or these questions, it, I, I get the impression that they're confused about something they, that they ought to know about but don't. I think Christians are oftentimes confused about Jesus. Uh, they believe in Jesus, they say, but th they also point out that there are plenty of other nice people in the world who don't. Who are, who are we to say that they're wrong? After all, um, wasn't the main point of Jesus' life to, to bring peace and help to the poor and social justice and help us to all get along? Wasn't that what it's all about? The other details don't matter that much. Um, sometimes Christians are confused about the Bible. If you ask a Christian point blank, you know, tell me what the Bible is all about. What, in a word, how would you sum it up? You'll, you'll get words like love or um, forgiveness. Or maybe people will say, well, it's about a relationship with God, and certainly all of those things are in the mix, but they're not actually what the Bible is about. It's none of these things. And finally, I think consequently, Christians are often confused about life, and it, it's not unusual for Christians then to wonder, um, you know, what does it all mean? How does it all fit together? What is the place that I play? What is God's plan for my life? Uh, what is the purpose of my life? And I think I know, after reflecting on this for a while, maybe one of the reasons that Christians are confused on these things, and I think it is that many Christians simply don't understand reality. That is to say, they don't understand Christianity. So uh, if that sounds odd to you, let me ask you a, a rhetorical question. I don't want you to give an answer, but I want you to think about it at least. And here's the question. What would you say if somebody were to ask you, what is Christianity? I think th some of you might say, well, I, I, it's a religious system, okay. Uh, it's a guide for living a fulfilling life. It's um, 
a way to have a relationship with God. Well, all, all of those things may be involved in the mix, but I think Christianity is much bigger than that. This is too thin a characterization. The correct answer to the question, what is Christianity, is this. Christianity is a picture of reality. In other words, it's a view of the way the world actually is, not the way simply that we believe it is. It is not taken from the Christian perspective just to be our truth about the matter. We actually think that Christianity describes the world the way it really is in fact. It is a view of the world. It is a worldview. And worldviews are kind of like pictures. Uh, they're, they're pictures that you, you can't actually see, though, unless you assemble the pieces. It's kind of like a puzzle. I have a, a little kid's puzzle here. i got a six-year-old and a three-year-old. They're actually not very clever at puzzles, but some of you might like puzzles. Puzzles are made of pieces, and you put it together in the picture. And a worldview is kind of a picture just like a puzzle. Now, Christians who have the Christian worldview may have the right pieces to the puzzle. They don't always have the right pieces, by the way. Sometimes they have the pieces for other puzzles, worldview pictures, mixed in, and that creates some problems. But they're not aware of it because they've never put the puzzle together. For many Christians, their puzzle of the world looks like this. Just a pile of pieces. They know some things about Jesus and about, about God and about the resurrection and about forgiveness and the cross and Daniel and Abraham and the New Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant and the law. And there goes Noah and the flood over there. But when you ask them how it all fits together in one picture, what is the cohesive whole, they are lost to tell you. Well, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the big picture. By the way, if you don't get the big picture of reality right, do you see that it's going to be difficult for you to navigate in reality? I mean, in a sense, a worldview is kind of like a map. It's a, it's a characterization of the topography of reality. And if you have a good, coherent, clear look at an accurate worldview, you are going to navigate in reality well. But if your worldview is just in a bunch of pieces, even if it's the right pieces, you're not going to be able to navigate very effectively. So I want to talk about what that picture is. I want to sketch out for you in a sense, the Christian story. Now, uh, the Christian story is a lot like many of other great stories. I, I mean, it deals with the great issues that all people struggle with, uh, the great questions everyone asks. It's a story about conflict and love and betrayal, about rebellion, about self-sacrifice, ultimately about redemption. And when you think about it, every good story has four different parts. It has a beginning, and then somewhere along the line there is conflict that's introduced, and this conflict has to be resolved, and then you have to have an ending. <laughs> they had lived happily ever after. That's the way stories work. And Christianity, the Christian story of reality, has all of those parts. Actually, if you use those parts and you use the worldview, the worldview terms for them, Every story has uh, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. In other words, creation in the beginning, the conflict is the fall, redemption is the conflict resolution, and restoration is the ending, how it all works its way out. Now, the Christian story starts a long time ago. How long ago is a matter of debate among Christians. That's not my point to deal with today. But there is something important I want you to note about the Christian story. It is different from all other stories in a significant way. The story does not start out with the words, once upon a time. My daughter uh, just finished reading uh, the first book of the Narnia series, The uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and she asked me not long ago, and she said, Papa, uh, is that story of Peter and Susan and Lucy and Edmund a true story? I said, no, honey, that's not a true story. I said, some stories are true and some stories are not true, and the story about Narnia is not true. But I was quick to point out that the story of the Bible is different. The Christian story is not just a story starting out 
once upon a time because it is not meant to be understood as a fairy tale or a myth. It is meant to be an account of what really happened. It isn't a make-believe story. It's the true story. And here I'm using the word true in its ordinary sense of the word. That is, it's true in the sense that it accurately depicts what truly or really is. Again, not true for me, not my reality, but true for reality, as it were. What I want to do in telling the Christian story is I want to give you the backbone of it so you can kind of keep track of it in five words. The whole story can be summed up, in a sense, in five words. Here they are. God, man, Jesus, cross, resurrection. Let me give them to you again. God, man, Jesus, cross, resurrection. That's the big picture. And actually, there's a logical order to these five elements because our story starts with God. He created everything, including the most valuable thing of all creation, man. But something went wrong, and so God sets up a rescue plan, and He visits the earth in the person Jesus, and He does something very special to rescue man from his problem, and this happens on the cross. And how people respond to the solution will determine what will happen to them in the final event of history, the final resurrection. There's the whole thing from beginning to end. And notice that in the Christian story now, you have all of the elements of a good story. You have, uh, you have a beginning, you have conflict, you have conflict resolution, and you have restoration. You have creation, fall, redemption, and they lived happily ever after, or something like that. So I want to tell you the story. I want to give you the big picture of Christianity. I want to tell you the story of reality. Now, every story, if it's a, a good story, has a, has a beginning, of course. And the first words of the Christian story go like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Actually, we could truncate it. Just say, in the beginning, God, because this is my first point. In the beginning... Before anything else was, there was God. Now, this communicates a whole bunch of things to us about the Christian story right at the get-go. First of all, in the beginning, God, He is the main character. He is the central person. The story is about Him. Or by contrast, the story is not about us. It is about God and His purposes. When I was a kid, I could hear my mom saying, you know, the, the, the words are ringing in in my mind that she would say over and over, Gregory, the world, that would be me, by the way, the world does not revolve around you. Maybe some of you heard your folks say that. I hope you say it to your own kids because it's an important lesson, not just for life, but for the Christian story. And if you get this, this could solve a lot of problems for you. Sometimes wonder, people wonder, well, why did God allow that to happen to me as if it were all about you? And it's not. The point isn't to find God's plan for my life. The point is to align my life with God's plan because it's about Him. Not only is He the beginning and He is the central character of the story, He comes before everything because everything that followed is what He made, and because He made it, it belongs to Him. So He is the possessor of everything else that is in virtue of proper ownership through creation. And we are part of everything. So we are not our own in the Christian story. We belong to God. Even if we have not come to terms with that point yet, we still are His. His. 